ME204 Curved Path and Projectile Motion. Let's do a quick review. What do we have in our Dynamics Toolbox so far? Well, we know that the acceleration is equal to the derivative of the velocity with respect to time, or dvdt. We know that the velocity is the derivative of the position with respect to time, or dsdt. And we know that ads equals vdv. In the special case of constant acceleration, we know that our final position is equal to our initial position, plus our initial velocity times the time, plus one-half our acceleration times the time squared. We know that our final velocity is equal to our initial velocity, plus the acceleration times the time. And we know that our final velocity squared is equal to our initial velocity squared, plus two times the acceleration times our change in position, or SF minus S naught. Now we've used these equations in problems that are linear, a particle that travels in one direction. We've seen this type of motion, a rocket that shoots straight off into the air. But how do we deal with something like this, where the rocket follows a curved path? We've seen this type of motion, where a ball goes up into the air and then comes back down in straight line motion. But how do we deal with something like this? where the ball travels on a curved path. When a ball moves through the air, we can characterize its motion by its path, but its position we look at with respect to its x and y coordinates. For example, we have a ball here that's at a position x and a position y. Our position is defined by separate x and y coordinates. We can also define that position using a vector. In this case, our vector r is equal to xi plus yj. Motion can be evaluated in each direction independently as well. For example, we have a ball that travels through the air along the path shown here in green. But we can look at each motion independently. If we look at the motion in the x direction, the ball moves straight to the right. In the y direction, the ball goes up to the top and then back down. But the position where it ends is the same as the position when the ball followed the path. Notice also that the velocity vector at any point in this motion is always tangent to the path. So how do we handle motion that occurs in more than one direction? Well, we treat each direction independently. Think of it as each motion occurring separately, like our ball example. If we have a position defined by the vector r with 5 6 t cubed i plus 1 4th t to the 4th j minus 9.8 over 2 t squared k, we can break out each direction separately and independently. The x position is 5 6 t cubed the y position is 1 4th t to the 4th, and the z position is minus 9.8 over 2 t squared. Well, if we want to know what the velocity is, we know that the velocity is defined by the change in position with respect to time, or dsdt. If we take each of our positions independently and take the derivative of each of them with respect to time, then we get the velocity in each direction with respect to time. In this case, our velocity in the x direction becomes 5 halves t squared, the velocity in the y direction becomes t cubed, and the velocity in the z direction becomes minus 9.8 t. We can then write our velocity vector like this. We also know that the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. We can take the derivative of each velocity with respect to time to find what the acceleration is in each direction. In this case, the acceleration in the x direction is 5t, the acceleration in the y direction is 3t squared, and the acceleration in the z direction is minus 9.8. We can then use that to write our acceleration vector. When we're dealing with vectors in three dimensions, it's important that we know and understand how to work with coordinate direction angles. Alpha is the angle from the x-axis, beta is the angle from the y-axis, and gamma is the angle from the z-axis. For example, if we have a vector in a three-dimensional space represented by 8 in the x-direction 
7 in the y direction and 6 in the z direction, we can find the magnitude of this vector, and we can also find the component coordinate angles. The magnitude for this vector is found by taking the square root of 8 squared plus 7 squared plus 6 squared, and would give us a value of 12.21. That just defines the magnitude, but we need to be able to define the location of that vector by its coordinate angles. Let's first look at alpha. If we create a right triangle from that vector down to the x-axis, then we can solve for alpha using cosine. The cosine of alpha is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, in this case 8 over 12.21. Or, the cosine of alpha is the velocity in the x direction divided by the magnitude of the velocity. We can rewrite that as the magnitude of the velocity times the cosine of alpha is equal to the velocity in the x direction depending on what we're trying to find. If we want to find beta, we relate that to the y-axis. Again, we draw a right triangle from our vector to the y-axis cosine of beta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, or 7 over 12.21. This can be written as cosine of beta is equal to our velocity in the y direction over the magnitude of the velocity. Again, if we want to rewrite this, we can write it as the magnitude of the velocity times the cosine of beta equals the velocity in the y direction. Finally, we can find gamma by drawing a right triangle from our vector to the z-axis. In this case, the cosine of gamma is equal to 6 over 12.21, the adjacent over the hypotenuse. The cosine of gamma then is represented by the velocity in the z-direction divided by the magnitude of the velocity. Or again, we can rewrite this so that the magnitude of the velocity times the cosine of gamma is equal to the velocity in the z-direction. The same would hold true if we had a vector that was representing a position or an acceleration instead of a velocity. Let's look at a curved motion example. We've got a truck here that's traveling up a circular ramp. The position of the truck on the ramp can be defined by the vector, which is in terms of feet, r is equal to 56 cosine of 3t i plus 56 sine of 3t j plus 0 0.02 t squared k, where the angles are all in degrees. We want to determine the location of the truck and the magnitude of the truck's velocity and acceleration after a time of 90 seconds. Well, we know what the position is of the vehicle because we have a position vector, and we can take the components of that vector out and define the x position, the y position, and the z position. The velocity is given by taking the derivative of the position with respect to time. So if we take the derivative of the x, y, and z positions, we should be able to get our velocities. The velocity in the x direction becomes negative 3 times 56 sine of 3t. The velocity in the y direction becomes 3 times 56 cosine of 3t. And the velocity in the z direction becomes 0.04t. We also know that the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. So again, if we take the derivative of our velocities that we have here with respect to time, we should be able to get our component accelerations. Our acceleration in the x direction becomes minus 9 times 56 cosine of 3t. In the y direction, it becomes minus 9 times 56 sine of 3t. And in the z direction, our acceleration is 0 0.04. At a time of 90 seconds, we can figure out what the position, velocity, and acceleration is by just plugging in 90 for time, t. In this case, at a time of 90 seconds, our position in the x direction becomes 0 feet, our position in the y direction becomes minus 56 feet, and our position in the z direction becomes 162 feet. Now we'll look at the velocities. By plugging in 90 for time, the velocity in the x direction becomes 168 feet per second. 
the velocity in the y direction becomes 0 feet per second, and the velocity in the z direction becomes 3.6 feet per second. Finally, by plugging in 90 for time in our acceleration equations, the acceleration in the x direction becomes 0 feet per second squared, the acceleration in the y direction becomes 504 feet per second squared, and the acceleration in the z direction becomes 0 0.04 feet per second squared. Knowing these values, we can represent our position, velocity, and acceleration by their vectors. With our position, velocity, and acceleration vectors known, the position and magnitudes can now be found. Remember that we can find what our angles are, alpha, beta, and gamma, by using these equations. Here's our position vector. The magnitude of the position is the square root of the sum of the squares of each of the independent positions. In this case, the magnitude is the square root of 0 squared plus 56 squared plus 162 squared, which gives us 171.4 feet. Alpha is equal to the inverse cosine of our position in the x direction divided by the magnitude of our position, or 0 over 171.4. In this case, it becomes 90 degrees. Beta follows the same pattern, where beta is equal to the inverse cosine of our position in the y direction divided by the magnitude, or minus 56 over 171.4, which equals 109.1 degrees. Gamma becomes the inverse cosine of our position in the z direction divided by our magnitude, or 162 over 171.4, which equals 19.1. We now know our magnitude and location of our position vector. Let's find the magnitude of the velocity now. In order to find the magnitude of the velocity, we take the square root of the sum of the squares. In this case, the magnitude of our velocity is the square root of 168 squared plus 0 squared plus 3.6 squared, or 168 feet per second. We can do the same with our acceleration to find the magnitude of the acceleration. In this case, the magnitude of the acceleration is equal to the square root of 0 squared plus 504 squared plus 0 0.04 squared which is 504 feet per second squared. Here's an interesting example of what's called projectile motion. If I put car number one at the top of the ramp and hold car number two at the bottom of the ramp, and let go of car number two, when car number one reaches the bottom of the ramp, they'll both hit the ground at the same time. Car number one follows a projectile motion path. Projectile motion is a special case of curved path motion analysis where our acceleration in the y direction is equal to gravity, which is negative 9.81 meters per second squared, or minus 32.2 feet per second squared, and the acceleration in the x direction is zero when we neglect air resistance. Since these accelerations are constant, the constant acceleration equations can be used. The best equation to use for projectile motion problems, and the most useful, is our final position is equal to the initial position, plus our initial velocity times time, plus one-half the acceleration times the time squared. As with curved path motion analysis, projectile motion analysis must be divided into independent directions, x and y. Here's an example. Let's say we have an object that leaves the ground at 50 feet per second at an angle of 30 degrees, and we want to know how far is it going to travel. Well, in order to solve this, first we need to establish an origin. In this case, we'll put the origin right where the object begins. Next, let's look at what's happening in the x direction. If we use our constant acceleration equation, we know that the acceleration in the x direction is zero by definition for a projectile motion problem when we neglect air resistance. Our initial position is also zero because we're starting at the origin. Our velocity in the x direction becomes 50 cosine of 30, so our total equation for our final position in the x direction is 0 plus 50 cosine of 30 times t. In this case, we have one equation with two unknowns, time and final position, so we can't go any farther at this point. Let's take a look at the y direction. Again, we'll use our constant acceleration equation. In this case, our final position is 0. Our initial y position is also 0. 
Our velocity in the y direction is 50 sine of 30 because we break this velocity into the x and y components. And our acceleration, since we're in feet per second for our velocity, our acceleration must be minus 32.2 feet per second squared. So our equation becomes 0 is equal to 50 sine of 30t plus 1 half times minus 32.2 t squared. Solving this equation for time gives us 1.55 seconds. Now we can substitute that 1.55 seconds back into our x direction equation and solve for our final position, which becomes 67.1 feet. Our next topic will be curved path motion using normal and tangential coordinates.